So, uh, hello and welcome anyone. Uh, my name is Sergey. Really nice to meet you here. It was a beautiful occasion when I'm here. Thank you first Dado, Bernard for inviting and also Alex for contacting for communication because it was absolutely like one week ago we just uh, met online and uh, planned this beautiful meeting. Yeah, I will introduce myself shortly. My name is Sergey, as already mentioned. I used to live uh, in China for 10 years and this is my passion into tea was very strong uh, and still in. Uh, so first the tea is my, how to say, the big passion of life. It's my, how to say, way of tea, how we call it in Chinese, it's a cha dao. And uh, so somehow it also relates to what I'm doing, my business and whatever, but the first is of course is love. And uh, why? Because actually the tea is something like universal communication pre framework how it can be called and uh, especially to ceremony so my assistant alexandra will share with you the cups so you will receive a cup personal small uh, chinese taiwanese and japanese cup i will help you yeah just uh, one cup to anyone yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> i hope it will be enough yeah hope if there will be one left so yeah i hope hope it's enough I hope that it will be enough. Uh, it's just 15 cups and I see we are 15 people here. So what I'm doing uh, in China called uh, Pin Cha or Gung Fu Cha, which means uh, the taste of tea. And uh, also there is a main difference between uh, Japanese tea ceremony and uh, Chinese tea ceremony. Uh, I believe it's uh, really uh, main difference in the all this, uh, how to say, flexibility of Chinese uh, tea culture. So it can be represented in very different ways. And uh, if we look to Japanese tea culture, it's very, how to say, formulated and very strict in some points. And there's a lot of rules, how you put the towel, how you act, how you keep the cup, how you smell the cup and so on. So it's very, yeah, it's very different. Uh, we will start from uh, the tea from southern Chinese province Yunnan, which is actually the motherland of tea tree, the same as the northern Thailand area and northern Laos, northern Burma, and northern Vietnam, and far, far eastern India. This region uh, is a, actually the mother, the, the birthplace of tea tree. And the tea we will drink now, it's actually maybe most old type of teas which can be harvested because it's need nothing to do. It's just, you just grab the bud and dry. That's it. So it's the freshest and most uh, easy to process the tea. Uh, way of tea. It, it's called white tea, but uh, some people also call it uh, Bai Hao Puer, which means uh, Puer with a white uh, hair on it. Puer is a region in Yunnan province, which is also relates to one of the most ancient teas, uh, Puer tea. Uh, which maybe didn't anyone know poor tea here or not great so yeah it's not it's it's great that yeah I, I see you know <laughs> okay uh, so poor it's actually most ancient uh, tea already mentioned and and it's uh, uh, started maybe first uh, talks about that began more than 1000 years ago and even earlier uh, and mostly this tea was consumed by the local minorities, like small nations like Lahu, Yao, Bulan, and other small minorities of southern China, Yunnan province now. In that time, it was a separate uh, kingdom called Dian. And this is why also we have a tea which is called Dianhong. So this, this relates also to uh, this period of time and also this historical moment you can share with the guys. Yeah. And uh, now this poor tea, it's also, it's a very well promoted uh, popular drink in China and it became uh, yeah so poor is uh, actually over time was uh, pressed into cakes tea like that this is a tea and inside we have a uh, uh, five to seven uh, small tea cakes how we call it compressed it and pack it in bamboo this is a simple uh, how to say a little bit smaller version it's a uh, 100 grams uh, per cake, but regularly it's uh, 357 grams. And it's uh, one of the most ancient tea on the planet. And now it's also pretty well promoted outside China, but maybe not so well. So maybe some of you didn't know that, but yeah, it's slowly 
became more popular. If you talk about Chinese uh, tea culture, it began be known uh, mostly around a thousand years ago. Then uh, one very famous writer and also now anyone in China recognize him as a god of tea, Lu Yu. Uh, he read in a book which called Cha Jin, which has explained all the rituals around tea and how it need to be prepared and which springs and which water you need to use for this tea and how, it, how to actually open up tastes and aromas of each type of tea. And this book uh, became really like a Bible of tea uh, for all the followers and later on more and more tea culture began developed. And uh, what is interesting about Japan, for example, anyone know matcha tea, yes? So this is a powder and now it's like a steamed green tea. But uh, not so many people know, knew that uh, in ancient times in China, especially in Son and Tan dynasty, there was also was a tea, also powder tea, which was made uh, uh, by like a, you know it was like powder also so it was at first compressed into small cakes and after that grinded by a special uh, grinder hand grinder of course to powder and was consumed in very ceremonial way it called Tan Dynasty ceremony now it's almost completely disappear but some Chinese uh, now try to rebuild this ceremony uh, it's have more than 30 vessels on a table. And what is interesting in Japan that they preserve similar attention to consuming of tea, uh, how it was in really ancient time in China. Uh, but now in China we only have something what I'm doing now. Yeah, thank you very much. This is white tea, just uh, for guests we just came. I just say a lot again, this is a white tea uh, from Yunnan province. It's really delicate. Uh, from, from steep to steep it slowly open up and the, we just can uh, yeah, feel that is uh, really fragrant and uh, at the same time very delicate. Is this tea here, this white tea, yeah. similar to the one that we have just tasted? Yeah, because uh, you uh, you have uh, tasted the first brew, but uh, rarely uh, first brew in China sometimes we didn't drink because it's just open up of the tea, but because it's organic tea we just also drink a first brew too and uh, here you just yeah you just you see uh, from the next tips uh, how it slowly open up more and more to new varieties to new tastes uh, and it's uh, became more rich in taste more rich in aroma more rich in aftertaste also yeah this is like uh, you know maybe I regularly when I do ceremonies I start from very simple uh, lighter teas to more darker fermented and we also try to follow this vibe. Uh, if some one of you feel like it's too energizing for you, we can ask for water uh, because I try to not steep very strong. I try to make a delicate taste, but because it's evening time, thank you very much. It's recommended to uh, not uh, drink too much. So this is why each type, maybe you have two, three cups, it's enough because we will have more different tea. Uh, so now I will let, make a second step. Actually, what I'm doing now, it's a, a kind of combination between the ceremony and a kind of lecture a little bit. Uh, now the ladies here, they are browsing my book about tea. It's called uh, Chinese Tea Geography. I spent for this eight years of my life. Uh, and you can also share with others uh, who want to look at it. Uh, it's uh, my kind of research and contribution to the uh, tea culture. Uh, that, that, that time when I started, when I used to live in China for long, I of course written about Chinese tea culture. But now what, what I can say that uh, tea culture is spreading, for example, your, our project we call Tea Culture Club, but not Chinese Tea Culture Club, because now uh, this way of consuming Gung Fu Cha, what we called it, became really international. Uh, so it's also a contribution of China to world culture of consuming of drinks, uh, because this way you not only kind of meditate during preparing tea and make attention all the small object on a desk, all the small teapots. I will explain why I use smaller or smaller vessels. Uh, but at the same time, you also receive absolutely different experience in taste, aroma, aftertaste. So it's uh, the same time, it's combining of aesthetics. It's combining of uh, gourmet consuming of product and also it's a kind of, uh, you know, meditative practice. Uh, so it depends of the 
person who prepare and who participate uh, the ceremony. It's still the same tea. So it's so just slowly open up. You still, yeah. I just, uh, I, I just make a sec last brew again because we have more guests just to share, and I will switch to next tea. But you can maybe feel the difference between the first and second cup. Because tea, then you brew it like this way, what I'm doing now. I use a pretty small vessel, which is called uh, Ishin pot. It's a mostly pottery from Ishin uh, city uh, in uh, Zhejiang, pro uh, Jiangsu province. But uh, now also the similar, similar pottery made in many other regions in China and not only China. But it originally came from Ishin as a first, as a motherland of such uh, pottery. And uh, also, it can be used like this vessel called Gai Wan, which means regularly like a one, which means like a, a cup. Yeah, the, the lid, uh, which is like Gai Wan, guides its uh, lid in Chinese. Uh, so this is also a vessel for a uh, traditional way of consuming tea uh, in China, Taiwan, and even our countries, also Vietnam, for example. Yeah, so I just use a very small vessel and put the same amount of tea when you put it in a, as you put in a big teapot. But I brew only two, three seconds, and it's uh, it's enough to to try the taste. So this is a very different way of uh, consuming. Uh, but at the same time, as I already mentioned, it's really practical. Uh, through this way of consuming, you are also receive a better taste. Actually, there is no tannins in tea because I brew it quickly, and for tannins you need to steep it for a few minutes. But when you do it for a few seconds, you have a different experience. So yeah, I will switch to the next one. Also, if this is not a lecture. You can ask any questions about tea if you like. Uh, uh, yeah, so I'm really open to answer. Because you know, I yeah. Have a yeah. John just told me that, at least in the British tradition, you're not supposed to drink tea in glass. And instead, it seems to me that in China or other yeah. countries, they yeah. actually use uh, glass. Yeah, actually for a brewing of tea, mostly even in China not recommended to use glass, but some Chinese, they do. They do and also because it's a kind of a modern uh, interpretation of a ceremony, uh, which was never existed in this way before 20th century. It mostly was developed uh, in Taiwan in the middle of 20th century. And uh, in this way, how I represent it now. And uh, some vessels like Steve, uh, glass Steve, for example, and uh, or design teapot uh, in the form of uh, uh, some Asian fruit. It's also new developing. And uh, what I love in tea culture, that is, it's a constant, constantly developing, ever-changing process. It's not like something which is like stuck in some exact moves and frets and whatever. Uh, you can also share this last one. Uh, yeah, and the, the Japanese tea server, is that yeah. not, not much more set? The, the yeah, it's, it's, yeah it's, re it's really something like that. It's very, very straight in moves and how you do it. And uh, yeah, yeah, very, very, uh, how to say, I call it dogmatic a little bit, maybe. Yeah, so uh, it's not bad, it's not good. It's just something completely different from what we are doing now. Yeah, so it's uh, something different. Uh, but uh, I also love uh, Japanese ceremony and I think that it's a good experience. But if, I, if we talk about uh, like a daily, daily consuming of tea, like when you just uh, want to have this experience like uh, each day, and uh, yeah, I just uh, brew it this way. For example, as we do today morning. So for me, uh, for you maybe it's like a head of ceremony, but for me it's just a regular consuming of tea and you can meet it in any region, not only in China, so more and more people get involved in this way of uh, uh, consuming tea and make it daily ritual and also implement uh, this ritual to daily life uh, style. And uh, it's really change you a little because then you keep uh, attention on such small issues, small things, uh, as I already told, yeah, it's a kind of a practice, it's just enjoying ritual, enjoying this uh, as when you have a wine or when you have a, uh, you know, watch something, talk to friends. Uh, it's very, very interesting to have as a practice. Uh, so the next tea, it will be a, a red tea, how we call it in, chi in China, but uh, in Europe mostly this tea recognize it as a black tea. 
And uh, it's a little bit misunderstanding because of the color of the leaves. And uh, just uh, first traders from Netherlands and England, they call it black somehow. But Chinese all the time call it red, red tea. Hong Cha in Chinese. So it's yeah. not the red tea that you call the Roy Boss. No, 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 exactly not. This is actually close. It's completely not the same, but it's close to the what uh, here in Europe and the Western world people call like, a, uh, you know, black tea. Yeah. But uh, actually, I try brew not very strong uh, because it's evening time. So it will be pretty delicate taste. So no other flavors were added to this one? No, it's just completely natural tea leaf, nothing else. Just the main difference between good tea and bad tea, uh, which is like mostly present on consumer market, it's uh, well made. It's a good technology, a good region, sourcing, uh, material actually also, of course. Uh, it's uh, right time harvested. Uh, and it's, and it's uh, also fresh for those uh, type of tea that is important because there are some types like uh, poor tea, which is uh, most of poor, uh, how Chinese say, you lie, you how, you change, you xiang. It means uh, the better, the longer it stored, the better the taste. Or uh, the older it's, it's more aromatic, it's more uh, fragrant. So the tea, the same as wine, have a tradition of aging. We will try one of these teas today. Hopefully, I have some. Uh, now it's a red tea. Yeah, uh, what we call black tea. So it's the most common, maybe you will recognize if you like a good black tea. I think you also love this one. Yeah, also I will give uh, this small vessel uh, to have a look at the tea. Maybe later on, Alexander also can take it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You first share this one. Yeah, just later also. Do you want us to boil more kettle, more, more water? Uh, still, I have. I have two more, and then when I empty, I will put here, and we can okay. boil more. So uh, in, in China, uh, yeah. the process of drinking tea is a very informal thing. Sitting around. Uh, no, informal. It's completely informal. Informal. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, just uh, people. When you travel China, you know how it's going. And regularly, if you talk about tea houses in, in China, it's also different from province to province. But for example, if we take like Sichuan province, it's a very natural thing. Just people sitting, sometimes even smoking, eating some sweets or some nuts, whatever, some seeds, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, watermelon seeds, whatever. Uh, yeah. And uh, so we just relax. But also, we have a tradition in Fujian province. And also some tea houses in Suzhou, in uh, Jiangsu province, and some other tea houses, which is more ceremonial. And it's uh, which is why I say that uh, the Chinese tea culture is very diverse. For example, I visited and I have a good friend, uh, one of the managers of uh, Hanzhou Tea Museum, Hanzhou Chai Boguan, and uh, they are represent a very good uh, museum uh, there, and they have a for each province, a separate room, how it's presented in province. And for example, if we talk about Anhui province, they just have a glass. They just uh, often brew tea in a glass, in, in glass uh, and it's okay for them. Or even use a big pot, as they do it uh, in the northern uh, west China. Uh, so it's really very diverse from province to province. In Tibet and also in Middle Asia, there's a tradition of boiling tea uh, with uh, oil, uh, with uh, salt, and some other uh, uh, also other species or whatever, just uh, to have a, not a tea, but actually, but kind of energizing food or drink. And uh, this is actually the most ancient way of consuming tea leaves. Because if we get back to the very beginning, uh, and we can talk about uh, Cambodia or Thailand. We have a special way of preparing kind of fermented teas. Uh, like uh, you just take the leaves and ferment it and make kind of food from it and add to salads. And also there's a tradition just to harvest fresh leaves and fry it with eggs, like it in Jin Mai Shan, Jin Mai Mountain in China. I also tried it a lot. It's very tasty food, actually. It's interesting. And this tradition have thousands of years of history and it's uh, it still exists you know in some communities uh, and it can be 
maybe I didn't met most of these recipes yet because you need to live there all your life uh, and maybe you receive more information but still you don't discover all China. Those who used to live in China can easily uh, compare it uh, to Europe, for example, because it's m maybe similar, uh, different, like pro from province to province as a, some European country to other European country, you know? So this is a like internal world of, uh, you know, we can discover it and discover more and more. Uh, but at the same time, there was also interesting tradition, not only in China, <laughs> also, of course, Japan, also, of course, Taiwan, which is Chinese recognized as China, but still it's, in fact, it's independent now. Uh, yeah, and at uh, the same time, also, we have Vietnam. Uh, they have uh, Northern Thailand, uh, which is really interesting region, and are now focused on, on uh, tea forest project, how we call it. Uh, uh, we have a plantation, not plantation, but actually jungle trees there, and we do tea there. I have some tea from there, maybe we'll try later. And uh, actually it's the same like Yunnan province in China. It's the same small national minorities which live in there, also Chinese which go there after the revolution in China. And uh, they just escaped the same as to Taiwan and the same also to Northern Thailand. And uh, now we focused on tea somehow. Uh, so there was like, you know, I miss China so much. So I just start traveling there and this year already for the third time I just go in there now. And uh, so it's also a very interesting region and they have also some kind of tradition of consuming teas. They mix it, uh, some Thai, small national minorities, hill tribes, how we call it in Thailand. Uh, traditions with uh, also uh, classical Chinese tradition of consuming and manufacturing of teas. Yeah, so this is very interesting. Uh, Eleonora wanted to start serving some goodies to eat. Uh, yeah. All this tea might go to people's heads. Uh, uh -huh. don't want to have uh, what do I think it's you okay. If it's okay, of course. It? Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. You can take some small uh, things to, to eat. Yeah, just to not be too energized of tea because in a uh, tea world there is a word called uh, 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 which in Chinese called the tea drunk a little bit because the good tea also have the same feeling uh, your consciousness a little bit uh, relaxed uh, it's still I would say it's focused but your body is relaxed and this is uh, about a good sta state of tea how we call it in tea world uh, because good tea actually has this tea, uh, tea state uh, cha cha no, you said it's about the state of the uh, tea house. Uh, no, 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 it's maybe just I mistook. Actually, the state of tea state, actually. So state of uh, feeling about tea, you know. And so this is kind of, yeah. The Chinese make tea with some things like the tea, like the orange or with the vanilla or whatever. Regularly, they prefer uh, to have it like completely clean, to not, uh, uh, make a, you know, kind of a, a strong mix it with some flavors tea. It's a European invention and the Chinese never, never mix tea. These are some, you know, aromatizers before it was made in Europe first. Now we have a lot because it came from Europe and even funny to say some regions which is like manufacture such tea. You can go to supermarket and find some international brands tea uh, with some flavors whatever like El Grey which is not natural mostly actually uh, we manufacture kind of uh, original El Grey we just take this uh, fruit bergamot and just add to the uh, with the also natural oil of bergamot to tea and this have kind of original El Grey but different taste but it's natural at least you know yeah so yeah uh, actually we have more a little no milk, no lemon, just this way of consumption, what you have now. Like in Chinese restaurant. Yeah, like in Chinese restaurant, exactly. Uh, but actually, uh, what I can say, I also not too formal, not too dogmatic in this, uh, uh, my personal relations to tea. So we even uh, start kind of tea bar project. It's just experimenting with uh, tea and milk and some matcha latte and puerocino, which could, and just take a pure tea and make cappuccino from it, you know, on coffee machine. So you make a, and it's a way of, uh, when you just make a kind of a dust from the tea, when you sell the tea, you have tea dust a lot. And it's uh, impossible to sell, but you can use it in coffee machine. <laughs> so it's also a kind of idea. I think that uh, we will switch to next tea. 
Uh, anyone tried last one? Yeah, this uh, fermented red tea or black tea. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's still, still, still last. How do we feel the taste? Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It's just the original uh, last tea. It's uh, originally from EC. In your personal life, what was the beginning of your interest in tea? Oh, uh, the very beginning it was uh, actually I was born in Moscow. I'm Georgian, uh, Jew, Ukrainian, Russian, whatever, just <laughs> mix it up. Uh, and uh, yeah, and uh, my wife, uh, she used to work for five years in one of the first, uh, after, how to say, after Soviet Union crash, uh, two houses in Moscow for five years. She used to work there. And uh, I uh, just also fall in love with tea. It was my first uh, very big passion. After crisis of 2008, uh, this tea house was bankrupt and uh, most of employees, which also was my friends, uh, also we, we talk a lot and they say maybe, oh, maybe we'll talk, open some other tea house by, by ourselves. And for that time I was a DJ for 10 years, I make uh, events, uh, mostly focused on electronic and experimental avant-garde music. And uh, they made uh, from 50 people to 5,000 big events. Uh, and I have uh, all these connections. And I had the ability to communicate with people. So I just, why, why not? And I opened small tea house. And from this is just start organically grow because uh, a lot of businesses collapsed during this period of time. And uh, somehow I was one of, the, of those who start promoting online very cool because uh, I have all these uh, relations into promotion, DJ, music, whatever. So somehow I just, it was my first audience. And uh, after that, I just first time traveled to China because I want to, I wanted to bring better quality tea and more for more convenient price. And also uh, my interest was uh, pretty strong uh, as the same as it was, I still have it now, you know. And uh, after first time when I arrived to, Mos to China, I just fall in love with uh, all these uh, people and how they interact and how we do and how 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 different it's to even to Eastern Europe but Western even more different all this culture and I just felt some strong passion to research to start traveling more uh, to bring some exclusive teas and uh, during 10 years till COVID. Each year I spent in China from six to seven months, something like that, more, most of my time there. So I even can often say that I'm used to live there, which is actually was. And yeah, and during this time we opened more than 25 tea houses across Russia. So now we have still have kind of chain, but in current times, uh, because I was lucky to open also business abroad in Georgia and here in Amsterdam and Europe, we of course switch it mostly to activities uh, abroad. And uh, yeah, because it's okay, a question. yeah. Some of our friends here are wondering how much tea we can safely drink to sleep tonight. Oh, <laughs> uh, if you have a problems with a heart blood pressure, I uh, yeah, I just recommend uh, two three cups of each tea is okay. Now we're drinking third one, and uh, yeah, I just try to brew not very strong. Maybe the second was a little bit more stronger because it's a small fraction, and it extracts pretty quickly. But the third one will be a little bit more lighter, as you see. Uh, and I hope, yeah, it, it's really personal thing. Some people, it's not too late, but maybe if you want to go to bed at 10, maybe it will be difficult, but at 12 or, me, or, or 11 something, it will be okay. Yeah, and also if you feel like very strong energy after tea, you can drink some water, take, take some candy, sweets. It also helps to reduce uh, this, uh, uh, how to say, chadzui, how we call it. So yeah, uh, regularly uh, I recommend uh, not to do it each day, but when we have a sessions like now, it's okay somehow have it uh, not very often, yeah, to drink tea in the evening, maybe sleep a little bit later, but just, uh, yeah, just as experience, but next time maybe it's of course better to drink tea before seven, uh, just to have three, four hours before sleep, uh, without tea, but it's also personal. Some people, for example, my wife, she drink often like a very, you know, strongly brewed pure tea. Drink like a rabbit. Yes, just whew, 
and it's okay and should go to bed. And some people drink coffee in the night and also go into bed. So it's very personal. And do you have uh, any sort of mission in the Italian market? I have uh, ideas, you know how to say. Uh, because uh, when we started in Europe, it was a completely crazy idea uh, for my partner who just just say, Mr. Sergei, we need to do that. Uh, so it's something like, wow, well, <laughs> crazy. Okay, let's let's do that because it was uh, also awesome. our both uh, re risk a bit because uh, as we know, it, this culture was not developed at that time. But somehow it became really successful in Amsterdam. So yeah, it, I think uh, we also can, I work in now on kind of scaling, but very accurate step by step because we established like a warehouse in Amsterdam and all these uh, running and uh, tea house in Amsterdam pretty good. Now we opening tea bar also in Amsterdam. And uh, yeah, potentially, of course, uh, this market is not developed yet. And uh, what I see that, yeah, no, not even in Italy, but uh, all across Europe, I traveled to France, uh, to Germany, uh, to Switzerland, Belgium, all these countries, uh, because they are consumed tea a little bit more, especially France and Germany. Uh, in Geneva, maybe I, I only seen one shop, and also in Zurich, there is one good shop. A Taiwanese lady hold it, and uh, yeah, and I, yeah, and actually, if talking about kind of research, I just see that there is a good shops which sell similar tea, also from Taiwan, some artisan teas, and also some researchers. For example, in Paris, there was a beautiful lady, Catherine Riventer. Uh, she is uh, French, and she has also written a very good book, maybe it's uh, non-correct spelling in French, but uh, uh, L'Empire du Thé, it's a kind of uh, empire of tea, you know, and she also wrote similar, like mine, book, but mostly on about northern uh, tea regions. I'm mostly written about southern, so it's interesting. Even uh, she had so great knowledge, uh, and she started maybe in uh, 1979, traveled to China. Uh, and now she are actually in Indonesia, I believe. Uh, the met and we had great conversation, maybe also cooperate in some point. So there is a really um, good researchers in Europe about tea, uh, also very experienced, but we're not promoted. We don't do like a scalable businesses, whatever. They focused on this kind of academic, uh, uh, maybe even scientific researchers, uh, do some small, very niche business, and uh, not promoted uh, wide. Uh, not uh, not not uh, spreading it, but now things changing, and what I see in the USA, in uh, California, uh, more and more people start drinking tea, and also here in, in France, Germany, some people start opening the shops, but not tea houses. This is uh, like uh, so from from this case, I start. I don't want to talk too much about business, but uh, uh, I want to say that we are only one chain in the world of tea houses. Funny, but it is because in China, in Japan, mostly all tea houses, very beautiful ones, very huge ones. It's not a chain; it's one owner, one to three, sometimes five tea houses, but not a, like a 25, 30, whatever. And uh, it also not international one. It just uh, only work in one country or even in one city because it's need personal touch. All tea house. Uh, also mostly built not on Starbucks basis, but it's just just each tea house is different. Each tea house have its own uh, vibe, how we can call it, uh, its own uh, uh, feeling, its own atmosphere, uh, and also it uh, must be very personal. Uh, the master who carry on uh, the attention to tea house, uh, he must really love the, what he doing. So it's not only like a business. If it will be like a business, it will not work. The same as uh, if you talk about uh, really mm, no like small bars somewhere in Europe and like an old guy uh, leading it and his father also was the owner of the same bar or restaurant. It have history. The same with tea houses. It's just living entity uh, sometime with three, four hundred years history. Uh, especially in Japan, they still have. But in uh, China, uh, during Cultural Revolution, sadly, uh, many tea houses was disappeared and now they're building up again this culture. I just uh, talked to one very good Dutch researcher, Frank uh, from Leiden University. He uh, researched Chinese traditional music and he used to travel in China during 80s and 90s a lot. And he told so many stories about 
uh, how China changed even in this four decades. Uh, but if we talk about centuries, it's just completely changing, ever-changing uh, living entity. And, uh, uh, and the tea is something which is uh, not changing so much, but also, of course, uh, the ways of consuming the technology changed a lot. Actually, in my book, I, this is mostly about tea regions and technology of production of tea. It's not about tea consuming and uh, tea ceremonies. I will have a next book uh, in a few years. I hope it's already four years work. <laughs> yeah, can yeah. I ask you a question? Of course. Can you tell us please which type of tea was this last one we had? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a tea called uh, Mi Huan Gabo Ulun tea. It's a very complicated name. Mi Huan in Chinese, uh, it's a kind of horny. Uh, horny uh, Ulun, it's a black dragon tea. All this, it's half fermented tea. It's not black, it's not green. It's something in the middle. And it also a uh, very interesting cultivar uh, because uh, these uh, fruity notes and taste which you feel now it's also natural it's no any flavor added it's just natural the same as rose you know why rose is so great smell or some other flowers and some fruits because it's just other cultivar so there is a camellia asamica there is a camellia sinensis and there is a camellia sinensis variant olum and this variants more than few hundred types only in Fujian province, but there's also in other provinces like Guangdong, Northern Guangdong province, Taiwan, uh, some other regions, more and more developing now. And also in China, there's a lot of uh, agriculture research programs, agriculture universities and institutes, which constantly work on developing new cultivars. So this is why the types and technology of tea is ever changing. And this type, what you drink now, this is one of the most complicated process. You can open uh, on the in the last pages uh, in the book, there is uh, explanations of GABA ulum manufacturing. It's a very interesting process. Uh, it's 17 steps, and it's also uh, have a very interesting step, which is called uh, GABA fermentation, or fermentation in vacuum. So actually, after rolling of tea, they put the tea leaves in a big sacks and put in special vacuum tube for eight hours or longer. And this, this way, the GABA, you know, the gamma amino acid, which is very good for a brain, and there's also a medicine with GABA, but it's a natural way of receiving this uh, very valuable component. Maybe you see a little bit acid in taste. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like a cookie, <laughs> the same. It's comparable with cookie, actually, so it wasn't right time. This tea made in Taiwan, but also we have a factory in, uh, near, uh, it's, uh, it's a region also of the northern Thailand, where there's a few villages of Chinese people, as I mentioned, and they are doing the similar tea. And mostly they export it to, to Taiwan uh, and to China, but mostly Taiwan, uh, because some Taiwanese companies just place orders there, but no one knows that its origin is not Taiwan, but Thailand. Yeah, so it's also a funny issue. Uh, Thank you. I leave it up to you when you think uh, the pause can be had so that I... Yeah, 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 yeah. And what time is it now? Uh, what, what time is it today? Oh, it's, uh, 8.35. 8.35. So maybe in uh, 15 minutes, maybe Ayo also introduced. He's here. Is Ayo here? He just... Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. <coughs> So that means you have people who are out there studying all this background before you invest in a new tea house. Yeah, yeah. Also, regularly a tea house beginning from the person. Because, for example, when I have some, we have a different concept. Sometimes a kind of franchising, sometimes I'm investing by myself or with other partners. That's so very different from country to country. Now we have already developed a Russian chain. And now, yes, as already mentioned, because of political issues, we mostly focus on a uh, European project and uh, also project in Georgia. And now we're building uh, two tea houses in Thailand, on Copangan Island and Phuket Island. And uh, have plans for Dubai and for other countries, but slowly developing because it only last three years I start developing the chain so widely because before it was only Russia, but luckily I have now not only Russia. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so, uh, yeah, now it's uh, kind of uh, uh, mostly I do networking, I just traveling around and 
grab contacts and share information and potentially when I see some people who are really like interested we start interacting preparing the platform for that and uh, this is why actually uh, but on very like step-by-step -step basis you know because it's not like uh, franchising uh, speedy uh, thing it must be developed properly and uh, for example even in Amsterdam I have a few investors who would oh let's open Rotterdam now I said no 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 wait I want to test all the concepts first and now in Amsterdam we already work in one year a little bit longer one year and one month and we only now start scaling for next small uh, tea bar also in Amsterdam and after that I want to scale up a uh, tea bar is a kind of a simplified concept for traffic it's mostly for introducing people into tea so it's also kind of small shop we have a bar and we also share this quality tea but for to go mostly not to sit inside yeah it's smaller version it's actually the same product but uh, simplified also we have in tea houses we also yeah they stand up and drink and because some Amsterdam regulations for example we didn't have a for our bar horic license so it's just for to go but for some other regions like in Georgia we also have kind of bar but there is a no restriction so we have a two tables to sit and people just drink tea and socialize and now in Georgia in Tbilisi we are planning to move to a bigger uh, place yeah and also for Dubai maybe we think about not a bar but a club because also people there like to socialize when they're drinking tea and talk and so on so yeah so this is a very I try to take any project very personal because it's uh, really must be implemented in local society and why the club is important because people uh, also be doing events there some music mostly ethnic or some chill out music uh, some lectures some science lectures some philosophical clubs whatever so it's also can begin like kind of a, a, you know community community and for those people who came there also buy tea somehow so this is like uh, supporting uh, the waves of communication and what I like uh, it, it actually it, the same in Asia the same way it's also developing in uh, in uh, China and Japan uh, mostly in China it's a socializing place the people came to tea just to talk just to interact with friends and play music uh, play cards even whatever it depends on you know, the club and the city because uh, depending on the culture of consumers because sometimes it's just a rule clubs or it's a uh, like very developed uh, culture related uh, uh, club like in Xiamen city for example when some lady come to you and make a ceremony and keep attention on any move and explaining a lot of stories about tea and how it's developing the tastes and the history of any type of tea and so on and in these tea bars and tea houses what is any kind of food that is up? Uh, it also depends. We also take it personal, depend on the project. Uh, mostly we didn't have any food, just tea. But sometimes when we have like small additional, just you know, very uh, sweet, 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 sweet something, Japanese uh, or some raw balls, you know, something like not too intense taste, not like fast food stuff, but something more delicate. Yeah, like maybe some vintage chocolate, you know, something like that. In the very beginning, uh, maybe some of you was not uh, present uh, in the very beginning, but we drank we drank uh, also one white tea, uh, as you remember. And now I'm really proud to represent to you some really exclusive white tea. Uh, actually, I have very last small piece over here. It's a uh, white tea from Thailand, uh, from our own uh, uh, project, which called Tea Forest Project. As I already mentioned, we have a 15 hectares of uh, wild jungle land and there is a grow uh, tea trees and it was like kind of there's also wild tea trees the same as an abandoned old tea garden which is more than 300 years old so some tea trees is from 50 years to 400 years and even older uh, so it's a really interesting tea and this is a These trees are in this garden? Yeah, 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 yeah. Garden? Yeah, 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 we're running this uh, with my partner Leon, she's from Ukraine originally, but she now she have a Thai wife. Uh, almost 20 years she li you live in Thailand. Uh, so she somehow start developing this project, and also later on she invites me to participate because 
I'm mostly into promotion and to do in tea houses and to uh, presenting the product and he mostly caring about the factory there and so now I go in there actually for a third time this year already <laughs> because it was yeah for a few t few times in Thailand this year yeah so this is a white tea which made uh, in the end of March so it's almost yeah just very fresh it was made a little bit longer than one month ago uh, yeah and uh, uh, it's a very how to say easy process Regularly we just harvest the tea leaves and uh, try, that's it. As, a, as also we drink the tea in the beginning from Yunnan province, uh, there was uh, only one bud. Uh, and here is we have uh, one bud and two leaves. Uh, because uh, this tea is more, a little bit more complicated to harvest and this is why we also use not only buds but also uh, leaves. Yes. Yeah, yeah, because if we don't it will be too expensive. Uh, but also we leaves as very tasty, so we also use it. But some people prefer different tastes. It depends on uh, how to say the production and also how people actually like to manufacture tea. So it depends. Is it true, Sergei, that it should be brewed the light tea at a lower temperature? Uh, it's you know it's uh, not a rule, but some masters prefer to use a little bit lower temperature, but uh, not for white tea, mostly for green. White tea, it's okay to brew with a high temperature, but also you can use a little bit cool, uh, uh, you could cool down uh, water also a bit. Uh, so you, have, you, you will have just a little bit different taste. And also there are some recipes for cold brews. You can even take some fresh leaves, put in some glass bottle, whatever, fill with the cold water, put in the fridge for a night, and in the morning you will have a great cool brew for summertime. And it's a good for most of uh, high quality all on teas and some quality greens uh, and some even white teas sometimes even black teas it depends you can try this uh, style of brewing but it's not good for aromatized teas and uh, teas from consuming markets certainly good teas needed for that and so for white what temperature do you suggest uh, for white if we just brew regularly i just suggest 100 degrees but if we make a cold brew it's of course it's uh, like cold water mm -hmm. and you just uh, wait for a few hours uh, and then you just it's kind of experiment you know because from tea to tea from water to water you can also put different amount of tea leaves inside and it can be different vessel it all depends, and then all taste will be different over time. You can share, yeah. So also, the quality of the water makes it. Of different. course, of course. This is one of the most important issue. Uh, so, as Dado said, here in Rome you have a great water because it mostly comes from springs. But full of calcium. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, if full of calcium, maybe filtering is helps. Okay. Yeah, and and this way you will have. A, Good water. Actually, I what I drinking now. It's not. A, it's what kind of water now? It's not. It's not filtered. Or it's filtered. This one. We, we, we filter. Yeah. So it's filtered. I say it's pretty tasty. I like it. Yeah. So this tea, uh, it's uh, you know, it's like freshly harvested and uh, same time it's uh, very how to say. Meh. <laughs> we just made three kilos of it, <laughs> and I bring uh, brought to Amsterdam just. Uh, for sharing, uh, and uh, we have like last uh, last uh, seven grams. We just and it's uh, uh, that's it. Next year, <laughs> next tea will be next year. Just because we also only developing uh, the manufacture this year. Ah, yeah, you miss uh, time of season of harvesting, yeah? No. Oh yeah. For how long? Ah, how long the season? Ah, yeah. Actually, uh, sometimes it depends, you know because regularly you can harvest uh, in some regions during whole year but uh, for some type of teas because of the temperature and also kind of uh, you know it's it depends you know mostly mostly it's recommended to harvest the best quality teas twice or three times a year but it's harvesting time and the first uh, first harvest very first harvest best better in taste because it, it's after winter season and the tea tree grabs more minerals from the soil after three, four months not harvesting. So this is the most, um, so this is one is like the best one. But after that, you have a three, four harvest in the same period of time uh, during springtime. After that, we stop during summertime because it's too hot. 
but in some regions not like in Taiwan sometimes they, they have even a tea which is called Sizi Chun in Chinese which means tea a four seasons tea which means that it harvested all the time during all the year and uh, so some uh, farmers also harvesting all the year but the quality of tea is different so mostly if you talk about high quality tea it's a spring tea uh, the same as a uh, some uh, uh, black teas, uh, they also harvest it in autumn time. Uh, all Ulun teas, they also have a three seasons, uh, like uh, spring tea, autumn tea, and winter tea. Uh, autumn and winter are very close. It's sometimes it's beginning in September, and also after that in December, maybe the last one. Also now, climate is completely, you know, changing a lot. And now more and more farmers start uh, harvesting very different seasons in regions they never harvest before. So, for example, uh, in ancient times and in more historical times, about uh, when we talk about Chinese uh, tea tradition, uh, they made uh, mostly harvest during uh, the spring uh, holiday, uh, which is called Qin Ming Jie. This is a bright days. It's regularly it's a days of uh, honoring. Uh, the ancestors uh, and they have a very big culture in China about that you know that's like honoring your father mother grandfather whatever you have in each village if it's not was demolished during cultural revolution and uh, they still have like all this line of desks with the name of uh, other generations and they have a uh, special celebration in regularly the tea harvesting begin after this celebration it's uh, around the beginning of April but now in some regions we have a fresh tea in the end of February, you know, because it became warmer. Uh, yeah, and the global warming also impact this pretty strong. Uh, and also other regions which never before had the tea culture or had a tea plantation, they had now. Like a Guizhou province or Yunnan province they had, but uh, not in so not big, not, not so big amount. So now it's really changing. Uh, and uh, so actually, um, mostly now were good spring harvests from end of February to the middle of April, something like that. But it's been very different in each region, each country. If you talk about Vietnam, it's a little bit earlier because it's so far. And in Tha Tha Thailand also, end of February already, even sometimes it's middle of February, even like this time. So it depends. Sergey, to give us a special experience, will you speak for a few seconds and explain what you're doing in Chinese? Yeah. It will be unique to the other Russian speaking Chinese. Ah, I can, I can you want me to speak in Chinese? Just for a few seconds, so ah. you have this feeling. Ah. 好好，那这样就可以了。我现在就是介绍给你一下什么是茶道，中最最传统的方式泡茶。啊、呃，这里是啊，建树一套茶壶。啊、呃，这样的话，我就是泡茶。啊、呃，最我自己爱的方式。啊、呃，我现在泡就是泰国的白茶。啊、呃，这个挺甜做的。啊、呃，所以这样的话，我就是呃，让你听听你。啊、uh, ，闻一下特别呃高压的香气，然后特别好好吃的汤茶汤，然后我觉得也口感非常好，非常好。特别的，因为我自己非还非常爱白茶的话，我就是很亲爱的朋友也给给你们试一下，啊、uh, ，something like that。谢谢，可以了，可以了，啊，谢谢。呃，这里有没有什么家？你什么都通茶，通中国普通话吗？没有。呃，你们都普通话？呃、uh, ，I just want 你你 you all don't speak Chinese. No, we don't. Ah,、uh, so I can speak anything, you know. <laughs> but you recognize maybe little. Well, sounds, yeah. Yes, but yeah, yeah. A friend of mine used to say, "I can listen to any language in a, in a completely fluent way." Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. And there was a joke of some rapper who really speak very quickly, and some people say, "Yeah, you, 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 you speak your songs or how we can songs about rap. You read your songs very quickly." And he said, "No, no, no, I'm not quick. You slow." That's so funny. Actually, yeah, it's in China. I like the way they interact. Uh, it's very polite and very, you know, melodious and 
Sometimes uh, for some people it looks like rude and rough even. Uh, we are loud often, they like very, for some people, uncivilized, like the tourists uh, here in Italy, it's most of, <laughs> before COVID it was like fully packed of uh, Chinese tourists like everywhere, but I love it, you know, it's very natural. And, uh, and if we talk about uh, some small minorities, uh, which is not ethnically Chinese, but some like Lahu, Yao, Daizu or Bulan, it's a uh, small minorities, mostly of Yunnan province, but not only like Zhuan in Guangxi Zhuan Autonomous Region or some others. It's also plenty of culture there. Uh, and uh, not only tea, uh, it's a music, it's a kitchen, it's uh, anything. And it's uh, really like, you know, as I already said, it's, it's eternal discovery. Uh, you can research it for life. I like it, you know, it's just my passion somehow. But also now China closed and I, when I say that I start discovering Thailand the same way and I found that uh, this mix of Thai culture and Chinese culture of the north of Thailand is also absolutely incredible so I really I think you really travel Taiwan Thailand like anyone do but uh, this northern area is completely different from this uh, tourist southern part it's a uh, interesting place to research and travel and also there's plenty of culture also some Japanese guys do some beautiful gardens and also some American guy do some mm, like a permaculture uh, project, whatever, some Swedish, a lot of expats also uh, doing some interesting projects there, as we do actually, the same. <laughs> so yeah, is there any Chinese tradition you should uh, let us be, be aware of uh, that they do when they drink? Uh, often, for example, when you, then you share the tea and you receive the cup uh, from the tea master, uh, and you just, okay, I'm just sitting and I just receive from the master. And I do like that two fingers and like that. Two or three times, which means this is a knees, two knees. Why? Because there is a, was a, a legend when one of the emperors in China, uh, he some, sometimes he just want to be, you know, undercover, uh, in, go into public, go to live a little li like life of uh, regular people just to see how people live and he was undercover of course but some uh, government officials and some other people recognize him and start falling on the knees but because he he was uh, he presented himself as a tea master and uh, and 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 he just said no 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 don't please don't let people know that it's me and just uh, show if you want to show your uh, ho ho honor to me just uh, just make it like that uh, just fall on the knees uh, just two fingers and now especially in Guangdong province and Sofin Fujian you just make like that when you receive a cup of a tea just to honor in the master so and because and yeah 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 or just yeah like that and take a cup this is some small traditions uh, in China also uh, there is a lot of traditions about how to how to sit around the table but it mostly relates to food not to tea drinking Something like in Japan, you know, didn't never put the uh, sticks for food like that into rice because it's regular for dead people uh, serving, so never put it like that, uh, like like we do with uh, spoons, whatever. Uh, there is a lot of small things, like in Thailand, never speak loud. When you speak loud, it means that you are do some absolute inappropriate thing. Uh, like in Japan, they're late, you can't lie. If you're late, it means like you're just absolutely disrespectful for. Uh, if you even let three minutes, it's last. wow, you disrespect me. And, and it's also sometimes with it in Taiwan, but less, because Taiwan was occupied by Japan for 50 years, first half of 20th century. But actually about Asia, uh, Taiwan is very interesting place because it's a mix it up, Western culture, uh, Japanese culture and Chinese culture and it so reflects everywhere in culture and music and tea actually all aspects of life uh, I like Taiwan very much it's also Taiwan, Taiwan. Korea as well. yeah 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 moment, uh, yeah I, I sadly never went to South Korea but I heard a lot about uh, but uh, if you talk about tea culture of course uh, Taiwanese is much richer and actually Taiwanese tea culture is a motherland of present Chinese tea culture. Why? Because the first huge tea company, uh, which is called Tianfu, uh, Zhang Tianfu, the owner of this company, was a good friend of Jin Jimin. 
uh, or Houdin Town, I forgot. One of the, uh, I believe it was uh, Houdin Town, maybe, yeah. uh, General Secretary of Chinese Party. And uh, during the 90s, uh, from 94, I believe, from 95, he started opening the chain, huge chain of these tenfu uh, shops of tea. And he started representing this kind of tea ceremony in his own way. Uh, so this is uh, how it started. Before him, it was really like uh, lost, partially lost and was pretty uh, unorganized and so on. So uh, he also built up Tenfu University and some plantations and start make a lot of research on tea. So it was really interesting how it started. And now later on, Chinese more and more, uh, but he is, was a, he's a Taiwanese, so he bring it from Taiwan, where uh, which culture was developed uh, uh, I believe in the uh, middle of 20th century after Gomindan came to Taiwan after revolution in China, after they lost this civil war uh, with communists. So it was like a pretty interesting story. And uh, also now Chinese also, how to say, include a lot of aspects from Taiwanese and Japanese tea cultures into Chinese one. And uh, so it's really like unique combination of uh, very var various styles. So, for example, this style of tea, uh, uh, tea presentation often called a gan pao in Chinese, which means dry brewing. Why dry brewing? Because I didn't even, even put a drop of tea on it, on this uh, uh, towel. I try, you know. <laughs> it's called cha xi. And, uh, and uh, how I can say that uh, in, uh, actually I put a drop. I'm not a professional master anymore. And uh, yeah, and uh, there are also some different other types of presentation, like we have a tea tray, special bamboo or wooden a desk uh, with a special, I know how it's called, like plastic uh, something inside. Uh, tray, yes, plastic tray inside. And you brew on it. And you also do it with a lot of water, just washing all you wear. And uh, so it's a different style, but actually, the same feeling and also but for me uh, which style of with gun power a little bit more closer because a little bit more how to say you need to be more concentrated and present and also it's good for traveling because you don't need to take this tea tray with you uh, yeah so it's a, not a rule but it's a kind of presentation also and people just focus on this thing but actually what I also love in tea and how it was developed in if you talk about culture how it was developed in Taiwan there was a very interesting story about uh, uh, Wu War. Wu War means like, uh, just uh, literally translated like no me, like non-personal presentation of tea. And it was a community of uh, tea lovers which gathered together and just uh, make these Wu War ceremonies. Like the masters, different masters sit in some place and represent the tea, but there is no brand, no any cards or name of the master or, or tea house which she represents. She's just sharing tea with the guests. And uh, this is a very good, I uh, also done uh, similar ceremonies. Maybe we do some uh, with uh, also some participants in the uh, Netherlands. We're trying to do kind of tea festival, just invite different people who are involved into tea culture. Uh, but I love the way how it's absolutely, you know, open, non-commercial, non-profitable uh, thing of sharing. And I still feel this passion, you know, I, I do it just because I love it. And the second is always related to business, whatever. Uh, so this is why I'm here and I love to share. <laughs> this is just my passion. It's okay. What kind of food accompanies tea in China? Is it sweet mm. or sour? Actually, there's a very interesting topic. I have on my YouTube, I have a very good uh, video with, uh, you can write down, it's uh, Mocha Nederland, it's, uh, it's in, in English, there is a very good uh, video with uh, uh, one sommelier from Amsterdam, uh, Robert, uh, I, I forgot his uh, surname, uh, but with Anna, my uh, manager there, he, we filmed a good, tea, good film about pairing tea and food. And if you're interested, I really recommend to watch this video, just, it's, it's really incredible, a lot of people send me greetings about this video because some exclusive information mostly it's not mm, not so many people who do that but actually tea is really good with some kind of cheeses uh, even uh, those who eat meat some kind of meat also 
uh, but I regularly don't mix it. I regularly prefer it's clean because I am as a tea tester. I need to taste it, mm -hmm. so I try not to spoil my, uh, you know, yes. reflectors. Yeah, yeah, it will not work for me. But uh, of course, with cheese is great. Mm -hmm. Some different kind of cheeses and tea incredibly mixed. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can just experiment, you know, and you find out your own way how to get tea and combine it with some precious food. And also, I, I think that this way of developing tea culture in Europe, for example, is a very good way because uh, the same as wine, you also, because wine for some certain food and wine pairing is a very broad uh, culture. And uh, I think, think that it's also kind of developing uh, for tea. Possibly it will be good if some people keep more attention on that, even do some research and write some books about that. Uh, but I'm a little, little, little bit more focused on tea itself, yeah, yeah, so this is my, uh, yeah, thank you. So maybe I think uh, it's okay, I bright brew last one or it's enough, how do you feel? Yeah, I'll it's enough? last one if I may. Yeah, last one? The last one that you have just made. Ah, so this is uh, just, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's the same. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I so really this, enjoyed it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, because he has to stay awake tonight. Yeah, 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 yeah. It will be okay. I always stay awake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So thank you very much for coming. For me, it's a great pleasure. And thank you, Dada, for inviting. I definitely will go again, as it will be occasion, because I'm just now planning to go to Dubai, Bangkok, and after that to Georgia. Okay, and we'll somehow, yeah. Yeah. Find you a place in Italy or Rome. Easy, easy. Even Rome. we can do like in few cities, like a tea tour, whatever. I, I really like. Find a place in Rome for Marta, well, please. Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you very you. much. Yeah.